Hello. In the previous mind map, we looked at hyperemia and edema, and now we're going to look at thrombosis, hemorrhage, and shock. So to start off with, let's always have a good definition. The definition of thrombosis is the formation of an intravascular mass. So that means it is within blood vessels during life from blood constituents. There are three major predisposing factors to thrombosis, and these are known collectively as Virchow's triad. They include endothelial injury. So for example, very common conditions such as atherosclerosis can give rise to this. Hypercoagulability, and also the disruption of laminar blood flow. This disruption of flow can be caused by underlying conditions such as aneurysm formation. And for aneurysm, we have mentioned it earlier on. This is sort of like a dilatation of the blood vessel. And this gives rise to some degree of turbulence, or in other words, disruption of the laminar blood flow. The presence of prosthetic heart valves can also disrupt the laminar blood flow in the heart and also even atrial fibrillation. And this can predispose to thrombus formation within the chambers of the heart. So what is the danger of thrombosis? This gives rise to its complications because of vascular occlusion, as you can see here. For example, if there is a coronary artery, a very important artery that supplies the myocardium, and say this has an atherosclerotic plaque, this will already give rise to some narrowing of the vessel and perhaps some ischemia in the downstream myocardium. However, this plaque can also rupture and this will result in endothelial injury and give rise to thrombosis and further the obstructive process to potentially occlude the entire lumen of the vessel. And this can give rise to acute myocardial infarction. Another very important complication is embolism. And an embolus is defined as a detached intravascular mass that is carried by the blood to a distant site. So it can break off from an existing thrombus, for example, go in the blood vessels to progressively smaller blood vessels and eventually get lodged there. There are several types of embolism and they include uh, thrombus from blood, platelets, uh, fibrin, also air embolism or gaseous embolism, as can be seen in divers, and uh, fat or marrow embolism, for example, in long bone fractures where there are surgical procedures such as intramedullary nailing, some of the fatty material may get pushed into blood vessels, and then eventually get lodged in smaller vessels downstream and give rise to ischemia at distant sites. There are several other fates of uh, thrombi, and they would include organization or recanalization, where you can get the formation of new small lumina within the vessel, and therefore this can restore the patency to some extent of the vessel. The best outcome, however, is resolution, where the blood clot or the thrombus actually gets dissolved, and again, patency is restored. The next major hemodynamic disorder that we're going to look at is hemorrhage. And we have mentioned it earlier here where there is actually whole blood extravasating into the extravascular space. So of course the lame man's term for this is bleeding. And hemorrhage can in fact be traumatic or even spontaneous or non-traumatic. Of course in the instance of trauma there is injury to the blood vessel um, for example, a cut, and this can give rise to bleeding. Whereas in spontaneous hemorrhage, there may be an underlying vessel abnormality, again, for example, an aneurysm, um, perhaps some congenital abnormality, or there can be a bleeding diathesis, for example, if there are low platelets or there are deficient or abnormal function of clotting factors. This can give rise to spontaneous hemorrhage. And also, if you think about it in terms of the clinical picture, it can be acute or chronic. And in chronic hemorrhage, for example, in a patient with a tumor in the gut that is slowly bleeding due to ulceration, they can actually present with tiredness, etc., as a result of iron deficiency anemia from chronic blood loss. When there is acute blood loss, if it is 
of a very significant volume, this can give rise to shock. So here we're going to define shock, and this is defined as a state of inadequate tissue perfusion that initially gives rise to reversible and then later on irreversible tissue injury and death. And again, as with everything else, we can subclassify shock into several different types, of which one common example is hypovolemic shock. This is when there is severe hemorrhage, uh, for example, from a road traffic accident, where there's a fracture of the femur, laceration of the femoral artery. Um, you can also have hypovolemic shock in severe burns, owing to loss of fluid into the interstitium and also diarrhea. So there are several ways in which fluid can be lost. Then there is cardiogenic shock, where if you look at the name, it does imply that the heart is at fault. So this is usually due to pump failure, uh, failure of the functioning of the heart. For example, previous cardiac damage from myocardial infarction. And there is also distributive shock. This one is actually a little bit different. It is due to generalized vasodilation and what can cause this? Things like septic shock from a bacterial infection, neurogenic shock, as well as anaphylactic shock. And lastly, there is also obstructive shock and this is usually due to pulmonary embolism where there is a blockage of the pulmonary arterial circulation and essentially blood cannot get into the lungs. And also cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is a condition uh, in which there is loss of blood through the heart muscle into the pericardial cavity and as a result the blood accumulates and essentially prevents the heart from filling up and thereby preventing it from pumping. So we have looked at some of the major hemodynamic disorders, starting off with hyperemia, followed by edema, followed by thrombosis, and finally hemorrhage and the different types of shock. I'm just going to rearrange this to recap a little bit. And if you remember, it is always helpful to have a visual guide of what can go wrong with blood vessels. And you can see here that we have included abnormalities of flow, so hyperemia, congestion, fluid leaking out, which is edema, whole blood escaping, which is hemorrhage, and space occupying things that are actually occluding the blood flow, such as thrombosis or thromboembolism, and also dilatation and weakening of the vessel wall in aneurysm. Specifically, we have looked at thrombosis and touched on Virchow's triad, the predisposing factors. We have looked at hyperemia, active and passive, which is also known as congestion. We have looked at edema and the different types of body cavity effusions, particularly exudative versus transudative and the different causes. And finally, we have looked at hemorrhage, which can be traumatic or spontaneous and acute or chronic, and ending off with a very short discussion on the different types of shock.